uh, which is Johannes Atoms from Newcastle University. And his title is Multimorbidity of the Aging Brain. So handing over to Johannes, who is uh, also online on Zoom. Thank you. Hey, Richard, I think I can now share my screen. Do you see my slides now? Do you see my slides now, Richard? Yes? OK. OK. Good. So thank you for the invitation. I will um, tell you about um, multimorbidity of the aging brain. So what we actually see in brains of people with or without dementia. Uh, just to say, many of you might not know me. I'm a neuropathology, but I'm also a consultant pathologist as a clinician. So this uh, slide is a uh, very uh, important one. It shows you uh, all these uh, proteins that we have to deal with. In the end, it may look quite busy, but it's not that complicated. We have tau, whereby this type of tau pathology, the tau pathology we see in ICS is by far the most frequent one. And this one here, frontal temporal lower degeneration, tau is much rare. And of course, very important player is A beta. In Alzheimer's disease, uh, then the synuclein, like we just heard in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. I should say at this stage already, I, we don't think that Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies is actually the same disease. They have the same pathology, but completely different progression. And usually uh, Parkinson's diseases are much more um, clear pathology. I mean, they have less comorbidity stones, but that just as an aside. And then we have very importantly, uh, just recently discovered the 43 pathology, I mean, the TDP43 pathology in FTLDP, but we also have it with aging without FTLD. I'll speak about it later. Um, it's also very important always, um, it's trivial, but um, if you know about neuropathology, it's trivial, but the presence of any of these protein aggregates is not specific. It's the amount and the topographical distribution or in other words, if you think of other diseases, cancer, you will have lung cancer. It doesn't matter how big it is, it is lung cancer. Take the tau pathology we see in Alzheimer's disease. If you have that like only in the enteral cortex, what we call Braxton, this is perfectly normal. Everyone has it if it's over 80 years of age. The disease only comes if it gets up to Brax stages four, but really five and six. So please keep in mind when you think about pathology and neurodegeneration, this is not a yes or no, it is a how much where. Good, this is a little bit uh, busy, I'm afraid, but it's an old, old, old old study by uh, Gabor Kovac. Um, and they had uh, a, a pathology group of 233 cases where they, they had the postmodern brains of subgroup of those with also good clinical data, uh, 51 cases without dementia, only 22 which. Yeah. And this just shows you uh, the pathology, uh, the prevalence of pathology. So everyone in the group had at least a little bit of tau pathology. And you see here, then and one additional pathology, so already two pathologies were seen in over 20, about 25% um, people without dementia, 10% with dementia. Over 30% without dementia already had three pathologies. Um, over 30% of people with dementia had a total of four pathologies. And then uh, even over 30% of demented cases had five pathologies. So this shows you already, first, what I saw, yes or no is not the problem here because you have so many cases without any symptoms showing pathology. But the pathology here is not as severe as it is in the group with dementia. Now, about um, disease, this is just uh, prevalence of pathology according to age. Here, this is the tau pathology we see in Alzheimer's disease. Brax stage is here, and as I mentioned before, over 80 years of age, everyone has, virtually everyone has some tau pathology. A lot of only low stages, so up to the here, stage five, six, then uh, you will have dementia. And if you have here, brax five, six, and here, tile, a beta phase uh, five, 
four, five, then this is what we call Alzheimer's disease. But what you can see here already is that EBITDA apparently 80% uh, over 80 years of age have EBITDA. So not around 40% have this pathology. And again, this has nothing to do uh, with a disease, just age related. So if you look at that, actually the logical consequence is that these are not mutually exclusive. Because why would being in that group here, having Alzheimer's disease, protect you from also being in that group? It seems rather the other way around that if you are one pathology that may actually aggravate other pathologies. And indeed, the most frequent co-pathologies are these A, beta, tau, Alzheimer pathology and uh, alpha synuclein pathology as seen in mentioned with Lewy body, Lewy body disease. And this is a study 2017 by John Trojanowski's group. And you see 30%, uh, these were all uh, dementia with Lewy body cases, 30% in that cohort had high Alzheimer level pathology. That means in these patients, you could choose which pathology gives them the dementia. They were all full blown. So it's very frequent, and you a lot at lower pathologies. And I will show you now data from um, a big uh, multi-center study in the UK from our Brains for Dementia Research cohort. And I will not focus on uh, less prevalent diseases, but just on the major one. Alzheimer disease was diagnosed neuropathologically, this was clinical pathological diagnosis in 31%. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies in nearly 10%, and then in 11%, we had mixed Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies. Again, meaning full blown Alzheimer's disease, full blown dementia with Lewy bodies. And if we now uh, look, yeah, here, with now this Alzheimer group, with um, in the Alzheimer group, 10.8% had low level Lewy body pathology and 45% pure Alzheimer's disease pathology. If you look at the Lewy body cohort, 41% had low Alzheimer pathology, 24% intermediate Alzheimer pathology. So this is not the mixed type I spoke before, I mentioned before, because intermediate AD pathology, low AD pathology not give you the clinical picture. So here we can see the main disease is uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. Then we had 23.2% with late end AD, um, but I can speak about it later. So now, but with that means, Lewy body disease was never seen alone as opposite to Alzheimer's disease. It's obvious because Lewy body disease is not as frequent as Alzheimer's disease. If you look at these mixed cases, again, these are the ones with full-blown Alzheimer and full-blown dementia. Disease. And add to those, these Lewy body cases gives us up to 140 cases that had uh, Lewy body pathology of which 53 AD pathology, these are the mixed cases. So if you look at it, more than half of all dementia with Lewy bodies had additional high Alzheimer's disease pathology in our cohort. I'm not saying that this is population, but it's at least a multi-center cohort. 20% intermediate, 23 low, and 3.1, they had no Alzheimer's pathology, but had something else in addition. And um, if you can see these here, I, I see here now this, uh, Put that away, yeah. Um, this is actually not astonishing because if you hear this group with dementia with Lewy bodies, well, again, it will not protect you from being in that group here as well. So it's actually not unexpected. Uh -huh. So uh, now let's have a look at the Alzheimer cases and the mixed uh, AD DLB together gives us a total of 300 cases. high Alzheimer's disease pathology. 20, uh, nearly 25 Lewy body pathology, which with Lewy body severe, uh, 7.5 low Lewy body pathology, and 68.0 no, uh, Lewy body pathology. Obviously, it's not so surprising. Alpha synuclein pathology, Lewy body pathology uh, is less prevalent than Alzheimer's type pathology. Uh, as an aside, you see that a lot of people had additional low level pathology. What we mean by that, if you have this type of pathology, be it vascular, the cerebral vascular, or low level isosynuclein, low level tau pathology, it would not give you any symptoms. So the question is, it's interesting, does it, does it matter? What we found in this cohort that 
the presence of even one of these low-level pathologies. It would not give you any clinical or, or well clinical symptom. However, it increased odds to convert from MCI to dementia by 20-fold. Uh, now I come, just check time, yeah. Um, now I come to this TDP43 pathology that we see in Qing, and that was first described in, I think it was 2011 by Keith Josephs and then Ms. Dixon. Found that the, uh, there was a TDP43 uh, pathology um, in 50% of their AED cases, and that has had an effect, an aggravating effect on the clinical symptoms. And this type of pathology always begins in the amygdala, then goes enteroanal cortex, antigyrus, and so, so it spreads throughout the brain. Other groups like ours looked at in our own cohorts. We also found it actually in over 70% of AD cases and also in 7% of controls. And then later, <laughs> yeah, um, in 2019, Pete Nelson uh, started um, kind of a concept, um, paper, if you want, and called this type of TDP43 pathology Lengvik predominant age related TDP43 encephalopathy. Um, and I was quite pleased with that because so then I always had to say in my neuropath reports TDP43 pathology as seeking and Alzheimer's disease. Now I said, fine, I can call it late. So for me, this was actually not a big, uh, nothing real novel. We knew that before. However, the, yeah, I should also mention the simplified the staging scheme, which is always good. However, there was a problem because um, I think this table, for example, was one of the problems. If you're not familiar with this, then you would look here and say, okay, you have cases with this late stage three, and 92% of them are demented. My God, this is a new type of dementia. And I know back then when the paper was published, there was this, oh, we have a new frequent dementia. Everyone has it late. But if you read the, the if you read the legend to this table and kind of look into more detail, yeah. Many of these cases have additional Alzheimer pathology. They have a little bit of Alzheimer pathology. The, in the vast majority have full-blown Alzheimer pathology. In other words, the TDP43 pathology here is not needed at all to explain the dementia. Um, we know now that there's a small subset of old uh, people, very old people, over 80, that they rarely can have this type of TDP43 pathology is the only um, comorbidity. This would influence, influence each other. It seems that you really do this. We know this from in vitro and in vitro is that uh, these pathologies really influence in the, each other. And there was this uh, paper quite old now where they have the, the triple transgenic mouse that has a beta and tau crossed it with the alpha C mouse and the offspring had both more alpha C nuclein and more tau indicating somehow that these pathologies do something to each other. Um, there are some other I mean, there are many uh, indications for that, but this is uh, by Seth Love's group, just to say uh, it's also so kind of obvious. You have alpha synuclein in tissue homogenates, what's related to level of A beta and tau pathology, if you want. So clearly there's something going on, but we know there's really um, not clear what is going on, I have to say. Um, this is maybe a bit from another angle. It's just um, because still quite common that people or that clinicians or, or neuroradiologists when they see the hyperintensities uh, in, post, in, in MRIs, they, uh, they automatically assume that this is a, a correlate for vascular disease, for small vessel disease. However, some and others as well, um, that, um, yeah, that these uh, white matter hyperintensities are actually rather the result of so-called valerian-like degeneration uh, and correlate the presence of tau pathology in the neocortex. And it's actually not so surprising that if the neurons in the cortex, the axons die too, and if you see that on an MRI, it will appear as a white matter hyperintensity. I should say this is really in particular true for the parietal uh, lobe. In the frontal lobe, things are different. There is more of a vascular component. Now, I mentioned the interactions, and, and we I mentioned we 
really do not know much about all these interactions between us, but let's look at the most, at the most um, frequent interaction, I should say. So we have early antral tau pathology, usually without any A beta, or not usually, but very often without beta. Um, that can progress up to Bragg stage four, but never higher. And I should say important because Bragg stage four is in the vast majority of cases, you will not have any symptoms. Uh, and those of you who are more familiar with uh, neuropathological literature will probably know that this is what we actually call primary age-related tauopathy. Um, this is just for this Alzheimer type of uh, tau pathology that is seen without a beta. What happens now, neo, or what can happen, in, as we've seen up to 80% of the people, we have a beta and that starts in the neocortex and for some reason goes towards the temporal cortex. And if I have no idea what happens, and I don't know any paper that really explains that, um, it acts with pathology, and this gives us then what we call the Bragg stage five and six, and this gives us the dementia. This is an interaction, and it's the most frequent interaction, and uh, you may know now what comes next. The name of this session is simply what we call Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease for me is nothing else than the occurrence of the most frequent uh, age-associated neurodegenerative pathologies. Now, um, uh, just what means this for our classification of disease. Obviously, uh, traditionally we say Alzheimer's disease is a beta and tau, Lewy body disease, alpha synuclein, FTL, DTDP, 43, and then we have vascular lesions and this kind of vascular dementia. That's how we would like that. It makes our life easy. We want it like that, but unfortunately, it's not the case. It's just this over 40% have alpha synuclein and so on. You can see that for yourself. Lewy body disease, over 90% have a beta, over 50% tau, over 30 TDP43 and so on. And vascular de dementia is very, very rare. Uh, the vast majority has additional G. So that's how we want it to be, and that's how it really is. But that doesn't mean that it's all a big, uh, a big kind of miracle or we have solved this. It's just important to be aware of this fact. Yes, majority of AD cases will have AD power as their most predominant, as their most important pathology, but we may have also other pathologies. Now you may wonder why I think this is important for everyone working in the field to be aware of. Now, um, if we look at the clinical AD cohort, just as an example, any clinical cohort, uh, be it by a therapeutic trial, being a neuroimaging study, being it a biomarker study, they have a cohort. Now, they assume they have tau in the beta and that's it. So this way you look at bio, they have 80 cases compared with control, and then we say, we test everything again here that tau and the beta is the pathology in, that, in these brains. But then uh, know now, or as we know, a, a subgroup will have vascular disease to a more or less severe extent. A subgroup will have alpha synuclein pathology. A subgroup will have tdp 43 g So in the end, you have no real readout uh, in these cohorts phology. You assume it's a homogeneous cohort composed of tau and beta, but we have, even if it's not, if it makes work, or it makes things not easier, it makes them more difficult, but we have to be aware that this is a homogeneous cohort. You cannot be a homogeneous cohort. And this, um, yeah, and our, our, our vision is blurred. We cannot see clearly what's going on there. So ideally, we would need post-mortem assessment of, of all these big cohorts, uh, which is quite uh, challenging um, and uh, it could be done on a biochemical way and but I'm not going into more detail but just to say obviously a post-mortem feedback would then afterwards really um, show the heterogeneity and you could test all your data that you collected during uh, life against the readout if you wish and then you may find that this is with tau and a beta only have other tau levels in the liquor in the um, if they also have alpha synuclein in addition. And in the end, this is what we want. And you could say a lot of clinical neuropathological work is, is in a way uh, an effort to job redundant because if you can say during life what's going on in the brain, we don't need to look at it anymore after, after, after death. But yeah, Johanna, sorry case, to disturb is... you, just uh, two minutes. Yeah, good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I have to talk. So this would give us uh, then a key better picture. And I'm already at the last slide, my summary. Uh, so I tried to show you that mixed pathology is very frequent in brains of the elderly. And of course, I think pure consequence of aging. Uh, that is individually different based probably on the genetic background. Uh, why do 20% never get any AB to pathology? We don't know. Um, but also um, epi epigenetics um, and, and influences during life. Um, additionally, low pathology apparently in our study increased the risk from MCI to dementia by 20 fold. Full blown Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy body is really not uncommon. 11% of our entire cohort, 12% of AD had additional high degree Lewy body, and 54% of LBD cases have additional high degree Alzheimer's. Uh, Lewy body without Alzheimer's is rare. Alzheimer's without any, we see that in 65%. And now the question remains are the current criteria for okay. Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy body, and so forth, are they really useful or should we not? In my view, you move towards the idea of classifying uh, uh, individual patients according to the pathology that is present in their brains. And in order to do that, we need to increase our in vivo biomarkers. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>